several times so you had only one example you will have more but another sector that is a good example within industrialization that is a story from a seminar that took place just before the summer holiday I was invited to a place called Sundansøre. All the Norwegians know where Sundansøre are. And those of you that don't really know the map, <laughs> you can find Sundansøre at approximately uh, two hours from here to drive in the car and at Sundasura there is a big aluminium factory we produce aluminium why come why come and I was invited to that seminar because every year there is a festival there, <laughs> and during that festival, they invite special guests, guests to teach a topic that they ask for. <coughs> <coughs> and they ask me to come and teach over how do you believe that this Aluminium, alum, aluminium sector will develop worldwide and in Norway. Do this local community have a bright future? Because it's a small municipality and approximately 800 employees will work in that factory producing aluminium. Mm. Do anybody here dare to guess why I told them <coughs> that it doesn't <coughs> matter what the head of the company says, don't worry, be happy, you have a bright future. Why did I say that? Don't worry. Be happy. That local community being so <coughs> dependent on aluminium, you have a bright future. Why come? Because many of you would say that you will not survive producing aluminium. Because when we start doing that in China, this is an international ma market and you will be outcompeted and go bankruptcy because it's a free market. Why did I say you have a bright future? I said it because I have been teaching industrial organization 15 years <laughs> and I am able to put that case into the textbook and tell them that this market is a market where we for the time being are playing over prices in a baton game. <coughs> Which means that 
when China's China invests in new capacity, we already have overcapacity in Europe, overcapacity in US because of the financial crisis. And when China invests in new capacity, totally, we end up with too much capacity. What do the players do with too much capacity? They start underbidding each other all the way down until you don't cover the fixed cost. And you might end up for a while underbidding each other all the way down to you where you just cover the average cost and nothing on the fixed cost. Which means that you accumulate debt. So in the baton game with a homogeneous product, aluminium is aluminium is aluminium is aluminium. It's not very different in quality if you produce it in China, in US, or in Norway. You compete in the same market with overcapacity with a homogeneous product. And the prices, for the time being, <coughs> is very, 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 very low because of our capacity. And I travel there and tell them, even though the company has said locally, we don't guarantee the future. The head of the companies are also, to one extent, a player. They play a game. So, locally, they were a little bit worried. Then they called for me. <laughs> and I do the job. I take an analytical approach and I say that aluminium is not labor intensive. No, no, no. So the wage level doesn't matter. It's very, very electricity intensive. You use a lot of electricity to produce aluminum. And it's very, very <coughs> capital intensive. It's very costly to invest in these plants, especially in advanced plants to produce aluminum very, very cost efficient. That is very expensive. And so, Norway is very rich on electricity. We have a comparative advantage producing hydropower. China cannot compete with the cost level we have producing electricity through the water every day when it rains. All the Norwegians will say that Mm, that's good for us, and the electricity bill will be low. <laughs> so when it rains, it rains money <laughs> for the Norwegians. Because that rains went up, will be a part of our hydro system. And this is the market. The hydro power will be put into the marketplace in what is very, very close to a perfect competitive market. This is the marketplace where the textbook don't have my example. But 
about electricity is an example of a competitive market. The prices will be decided by the market forces. And in China, how do you increase the capacity of producing electricity? Investing in thermal energy, especially coal, and you will have to pay world market price for the coal and the electricity price will be higher on the margin producing electricity in China because you don't compete on the wage level. The electricity prices will be dependent on the coal prices worldwide for the time being on their own and investing in plants to produce electricity capital intensive but it doesn't help you in China to have low labor prices because it's not labor intensive so we have a comparative advantage through having access to clean energy clean electricity I don't know that is taken care of in a perfect competitive market and we export electricity but in addition to exporting electricity one third of <coughs> our capacity we put into producing aluminium and other electricity intensive goods that we export. So we have a comparative advantage through being rich on electricity, being rich on capital, and since it's not labor intensive, it doesn't matter that the wage level is high. If the price level on, an, on electricity will be low. Why come people in the local community worry about the future? So to remind you, this is a bad whole game. You'll find that in the textbook. Under Part, part two, modern industrial organization. And I just visited the bookshop after the break. And I said that we have too many students. How many textbooks have you ordered? And he said, 25. Oh, we are much more than 25. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I know maybe some of you will buy from former students. So it's not easy to predict how many he will sell. But he had only 25 now. So we'll easily see uh, next week rush to the bookshop <laughs> and next week we'll see how many textbook we have to order and those of you that will have no access to the textbook I'll find some. I have some that you can dispose of for a while. Okay? Aluminium, <coughs> comparative advantage. First, this is an example of a battle game. And I remind you that the aluminium sector has so far 
never been one of my examples in any exam <laughs> final exam so far <laughs> could easily be because of my lecture just before summer and I found that very interesting not because it's about Hongen and not because Norway has a comp competitive advantage and not because the electricity market is an example of a perfect competitive market in this region but there are one particular reason why it was interesting to meet them why do they worry why do they need me why come didn't the head of the aluminium industry just turn up and tell them we are going to be here forever? Huh. Why can't they worry? Because now it might be that some of the politicians will find me at YouTube <coughs> um, um, I dare to say this but no and then <coughs> because of the camera I need to be a little bit careful because I'm quite well known by the government <laughs> and the head of the political system and the industry so no and then I will say mm, don't say this you have a camera but why did they worry because the industry is a player they negotiate in addition to the market price they negotiate special condi conditions a rather complex one for the government and when they play they of course will say that if we don't succeed to have a framework that is even better than the good framework we'll have today we might leave in Norway <laughs> <laughs> and just leave that to another so they are players and when the politicians will be confronted with the mayor mm. traveling to Oslo and say that if you don't do just exactly what the company asked for they must they might close down mm. this aluminium plant so there is a single game going on so the head of the company will signal we need better framework the politicians will feel the pressure when the mayor turns up but for me I just look in the text to the textbook and see that there is something here we call a signal here. and the stronger they signal and the more intensive the mayor will do the lobby towards the government the better framework the company will achieve so do they have a reason to worry do they play their role and that stupid professor <laughs> that will come there now and then and tell them that this is a single hand they keep on inviting <laughs> so every time when they have a crisis since 1988 <laughs> they have invited me to come to their seminar 
And I say the same thing every time. Don't worry, be happy. You have a bright future. I said that in 1988. And I said this, exactly the same analytical approach. I said it again. And at the front page the day after, <laughs> in the local newspaper, a very optimistic professor. <laughs> And, in 1988, the same, the same front page, very optimistic. <laughs> so, the conclusion, I am part of the game. <laughs> so, I'm playing too. And I know my role. So, I'm playing. The company playing. The mayor playing, and we are players in a game theoretic approach. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so every day around us, we see this kind of games taking place. And what I am going to teach you is how to understand the world, the real world. In a game theoretic approach, that is difficult. I have trained, I've been trained in doing this many, 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 many years. And, and every time when I lecture, I learn something new. <laughs> so when I lectured last year, the lecture this year, will be different. Why? One year later, and I've learned something. So, I learned not the proper model, because all these models are old. So old that that is not the theory that develops, but the art is to apply it in real life. And what I'm good at is not pure mathematical theory within industrial organization. But I can promise you that, and I dare to say it when the karma is on, I, I am among the best to apply it on Norwegian real life and industry. That's where I'm quite good. Not proper theory. So what you are going to hear from me is to apply it. <coughs> and when you leave this course, if you had learned something, and you, if you have listened to me, every time when you see an economic case, you look for who is the players? How do they play? Is this a Kono game? Is it a Madhong game? Is it monopolistic competition? Do they play over differentiated products? Do they play over R&D? Do they play over marketing? Business practices. And if you have learned something to me, from me, it is to understand the economy, the economy in a game theoretic approach. Very easy, but very difficult. <laughs> one more case. You manage one more. This is the last one for today. <coughs> we have one more sector <coughs> that is important in Norway. And can you guess one sector I haven't mentioned so far? Fish, Fish farming. 
fish farming. Bravo! <laughs> fish farming. This is an R and D intensive sector because of diseases. And we have a rather quick clean coastal area with cold water and there's a need for the fjords to be clean and cold. And in addition to that, we started very, very early to invest heavily in R&D connected to diseases within the fish farming industry. So it's an R&D driven sector. And our comparative advantage, why can that Norway is world famous and is dominant player worldwide selling salmon? I am. I was a fisherman. I know to go salmon fishing in the rivers, and that's a beautiful sport. <coughs> but fish farming, why can orange eagle and the clean manure? <coughs> and the biggest company is in Norway producing salmon. Called Marine Harvest. This has once been an example in the exam, <coughs> but it come, can come once more. <coughs> 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 then, fish farming is competing worldwide, <coughs> and it's an international market. The prices will be decided in a perfect competitive market where supply and demand will decide what the price level will be. And for the time being, the Russian, because of the conflict with Norway, the Ukraine, the Russian all of a sudden stopped buying Norwegian salmon. There is a trade war going on between Russia and Europe and the United States because of the crisis in Ukraine. And when they stopped buying Norwegian salmon, is that the problem for Norway? Is it? Because uh, Russia was buying a lot of the Norwegian uh, salmon, or a very big percentage of it. And now it's expected that the Norwegian price of the salmon is going to drop on the Norwegian market, and it will be cheaper for Sweden to fish salmon. But how much? <laughs> but how much will it drop? What will the Norwegian fish farming industry do? They immediately will start switching to new markets. Where will they sell more? <coughs> they will sell more to Asia. Mm -hmm. They will sell more to Europe. They will send it with planes to US. Mm. What happens in the market? The prices worldwide will drop a little bit, a little bit. But from this professor, again, don't worry, be happy, welcome. <coughs> After a while, we don't need the Russian market. 
we'll sell the fish to other markets. So it's a problem for a very short while, and it's a minor economic problem in all. Why? Because this produces fish farming in Norway. You name it. The biggest in the world. <laughs> that one is owned, Marine Harvest, is owned by one of the richest people in the world. <laughs> he was a Norwegian, but he left Norway because of the tax level. <laughs> <laughs> now he lives in London. One of the richest in the world. Fredrickson. He owns the biggest company, Marine Harvest. Do you think he would worry? No. No, no, no. One, he has financial muscles. And this sector, you know what? Care financial muscles. So, for a short while, the newspapers will be filled up with this being a big problem. But as an economist, the newspaper can write and, and tell about crisis. <coughs> and no, and then make people believe that this is a crisis. That will go over very soon. Very soon. But the topic that interests me more, what will happen in the long run, is here, two years ago, we have a very, very good example of <coughs> a code organ from the textbook and an entry game an entry game. The suppliers of feed and nutrition suppliers of feed and nutrition are only three big international companies. One, two, three suppliers. They don't play over prices. They play over quantity. <coughs> and that's a Kono game. And a Kono game is a two-step game where they first decide on capacity and find the national equilibrium in prices and in a simultaneous solution, playing over quantity in the Konoge, they earn a lot of money. So these the three feeder companies, feed companies, the suppliers, they have market power. They don't compete over prices. No. They don't underbid each other. No. They just regulate capacity to earn a lot of money. And there will be only three. So they play the Konoge. Two years ago, the salmon prices fall dramatically internationally. <coughs> and that happens no and then. Two years ago, the salmon prices fall dramatically. And then, Marine Harvest, the big company, got angry. Why? Because the feed suppliers kept their prices high. They used their market power kept the prices high. And what was left as the profit for Fredrickson and Ma Marine Harvest 
was so low, because of the feed suppliers using the market power, and they earned exactly the same, because when the prices worldwide dropped, they kept the same price level and feed the nutrition. And that is 60% of the cost. So it's easy to understand at that guy Fredriksen with the financial muscles <laughs> got angry because he wants to earn money on all his activities. What did they do? They started to play the entry game. Marine Harvest said, if the prices doesn't drop, we invest 700 million kroners in new capacity. And you know from logistics, make or buy. This is a good example. They played make, we make the feed ourselves. Just invest, and I have financial money. <coughs> what happened? Do you think the prices dropped? Do you think they invested? Or was it only an entry game? They threatened to invest, but what can the big players playing the Kono game, what can they do? They can take a counter move and say that if you invest, we invest too. And then we will have a breakdown in the market. And so they can start to threaten each other. If you do that, I will do that. And if I do that, what will you do? And if you do that, what will I do? And so back and forth. <coughs> this is from the textbook, the entry game. And in this course, you will meet this example updated because it happened two years ago. And now, I will update it and tell you the story, what did really happen two years later. Did they produce, and do they produce now the feed themselves? Or do they use the market now, two years later? The answer will come in a later lecture. And today, my stories are over. <laughs> and for all of you, have a good weekend. And turn, go to the button. I can easily see that most of you were here to the bitter end. <laughs>